I have often said in relation to many spiritual scientific observations that the concern of our spiritual scientific movement and what it endeavors to achieve is not primarily one of theoretically absorbing those concepts and ideas that one may acquire through spiritual science, but that the fruits of spiritual science should become part of the most intimate stirrings and impulses of our life of soul. To be sure, we must proceed from the results of spiritual scientific knowledge, and one can only acquire such knowledge if one studies it and concerns oneself with it. But spiritual science should not be apprehended like any other science, so that one knows merely in hindsight that one has heard something or other, that this or that is true with respect to some established fact. Rather, should spiritual science work upon our soul in such a way that the soul becomes different in a certain aspect of its feeling life, that it becomes different as a result of receiving what can flow through spiritual science. The concepts, ideas, and images that we acquire through spiritual science should stir our soul in the most intimate way. They should unite with our feeling life so that we learn through spiritual science not only to see the world differently, but also to feel differently about it than we would otherwise. A spiritual scientist should enter into certain life situations quite differently than is possible without spiritual science. And only if he can do this has he really achieved what spiritual science has to offer us. We are living at present at a difficult time when an aspect of the most important questions of spiritual science, that of death, is appearing in so many innumerable instances before our eyes, souls, and hearts, for some in a very immediate sense, for others somewhat more remotely. The spiritual scientist should also, in this grievous time, be able to keep spiritual science alive in his heart. He should be able to relate differently to the events of the time, even when he is very close to them, than someone else. One person may need consoling, Another may need cheering up, but both should find these in spiritual science. Only when this can be the case have we understood spiritual science in its true sense. The intensity with which the ideas of spiritual science affect us enables us to experience that we learn to feel quite differently about many things than we feel about anything in the world without spiritual science if we peruse much of what has already been said in the context of our spiritual science about the riddle of death, you will be able to understand much of what I should like to say today. This will augment what I have already explained and will not merely be a repetition of previous statements. We must learn not only to think differently about death, but we must learn to feel differently about it for the riddle of death is indeed connected with the deepest mysteries of the spiritual world. We must be quite clear that we lay aside all that enables us to form perceptions and acquire knowledge in the physical world, and hence to experience anything of the outer world when we pass through the gate of death. We form ourselves in the physical world through our sensory impressions of the world. We lay these senses aside, when we enter the spiritual world, we have them no longer. This should already serve us as a proof that we must make efforts to think in a different way from how we have learned to think through our senses when we think about the supersensory world. It is true that we have a kind of reference point in that something analogous, something of a similar kind to the experiences in the spiritual world, manifests itself also in the ordinary life that we spend between birth and death. This comes in the form of the dream experiences that enter into ordinary life. We do not apprehend dream experiences through our senses, and indeed our senses have nothing to do with them. Nevertheless, they are clothed in images that are sometimes reminiscent of sensory life. In these dream images albeit in a weak form, we have a reflection of the manner in which spiritual existence approaches us as a world of imagination between death and a new birth. 
We have imaginative perceptions after death. Experience manifests itself in images. But if, for example, you see a red color in the world of the senses and feel moved to ask what lies behind this red color, you will say that it is something that fills the space, something of a material nature. The red color also appears to you in the spiritual world, but there is nothing material behind it, nothing that would give a material impression in the ordinary sense. Behind the red is a soul spiritual being. Behind the red is the same that you feel with your soul as your world. One could say that from the sense impression of the color we descend in the outward physical sense to the material world, whereas from imaginative perceptions we rise up ever higher into spiritual regions in the spiritual world. Now we must be quite clear, and this is especially emphasized in the new edition of Title Theosophy, that these imaginative perceptions do not present themselves to us as do sense impressions of the physical world. These imaginations are certainly there, but we encounter them as experiences. The red, the blue, are in that context experiences. One may justifiably refer to these imaginations as red or blue, but they are of a somewhat different nature than the sense impressions of the physical world. They are far more intimate. We are connected with them in a far more intimate way. In the outward context you are separate from the red color of the rose, but you feel yourself to be within the red color in the spiritual world. You are connected with the red color. When you perceive something red in the spiritual world, the powerful will of a spiritual being is unfolding. This will raise forth and what it radiates forth is red. Yet you feel yourself to be within this will. And this experience of being within, of feeling oneself within, you then quite naturally characterize as red. It could be said that the physical color is like a frozen spiritual experience, a congealed spiritual experience. This is just one example of how we must develop the capacity in many areas to think somewhat differently, to give different values and meanings to our concepts, if we really want to rise to an understanding of the spiritual world. Then we also need to be aware that in the spiritual world, the relationship of what we call imaginations to the spiritual beings who express themselves in, for example, colors, is not like the relationship of a color to a sense-perceptible being. The rose is red. That is a quality of the rose. But when a spirit comes near to us, and in accordance with what has just been said, we are aware that the spirit radiates red. The red is not a quality of the spirit in the way that the red is a quality of the rose. This red is rather a revelation of the inner aspect of the spirit. It is more like a script that the spirit inscribes into the spiritual world. One has but to discern what lies behind the imaginations. The activity that one develops here is only to be compared in the physical world with its aramonic reflection, that is, with reading. We behold the rose's red color and we know that red is a quality of the rose. The red in the spiritual world is something that we do not merely behold, but we interpret it, though not in a fanciful way. I must forever be warning against this. Our soul discovers out of itself that it has been presented with a sound, a letter, something that needs to be deciphered or read, enabling one to know what is meant. The spirit means something when it manifests itself as red or blue or green or as C or G sharp. The spirit means something by this. One begins to speak with the Spirit. One begins to read its script. Our ordinary cultural life depends on the fact that such things, which have their deep wisdom in the spiritual world, are then also transplanted into the outer world. We speak rightly of an occult reading, 
or someone who acquires a clairvoyant consciousness, who enters into the spiritual world, who perceives the imaginations and learns to decipher them, beholds the essential nature of the souls that live in the spiritual world, not only through colors, but also through other impressions, which are reminiscent of sense impressions and those that have newly arisen in the spiritual domain. This activity, which is purely of a soul-spiritual nature, is under the sway of rightly evolved spiritual beings. Here in the physical world, Araman forms a reflection of what I have been characterizing. Ordinary reading of characters in the physical world is an Aramanic reflection of this occult reading. For all reading in the physical world, through signs that are formed artificially, is an Aramanic activity. Not without justice has the invention of printing been experienced as a, in quotes, black art, as it has been called. One ought not to think that one might be able to escape from the clutches of Lucifer and Araman through expedients of whatever kind. Lucifer and Araman must have their place in outward culture. It is only necessary to find the point of balance, of finding the middle way when life inclines constantly toward the Luciferic and Aramanic side. If someone were not to want to be affected by Araman, he would never learn to read. But it is not a question of fleeing from Araman and Lucifer, but that we enter into a right relationship with them, that in spite of the fact that we are surrounded by their forces, we are able to relate in the right way to them. When we know that we follow what we have so often referred to as the Christ impulse that dwells within us, and when we embrace the spiritual feelings that inspire the will to follow Christ at every moment of our lives, we can also read. We may then learn, and we will do so if it is karmically right for us, that Araman initiated reading, and we will view this Aramanic art in the right light. If we do not discover this, we will be verbally giving praises to Aramanic culture, to the progress, to the glory of Aramanic culture as exemplified by reading. But all such things also entail obligations, and it is a question of honoring them. Especially at our present time, much can be said by way of defending or opposing one thing or another. Indeed, we have what we may call a flood of war literature. Every day brings not only brochures, but also books. Among these, one can also often read statements such as, this country has such and such a number of illiterate people, of people who read and write, and so on. It would not be consistent with what someone familiar with spiritual science might say, out of his sense of responsibility, to accept such a statement at face value. Were I, for example, to want, with respect to what I have to say about our present time, to adduce all sorts of bad things about a particular nation, and in order to make my point, say that there are such a number of people in this country who cannot read and such a number of people who cannot write, I would not be speaking rightly from a spiritual scientific point of view. Only those things should be put forward for which one can bear responsibility in terms of one's occult obligations. From this you see, I merely wished to cite this as an example, that spiritual science must really also enter into life in this deeper sense and honor its obligations. And if the spirit researcher says things that others also say, you will always be able to see that they are said in a completely different context, which is what matters. To someone who is unfamiliar with spiritual science, much of what is said within spiritual science will therefore quite naturally often seem very strange since he is used to having different conceptions and will sometimes feel obliged to say to himself, this spiritual science calls black white and white black. And in fact, this is sometimes necessary. For if one reaches up into the spiritual world with the ordinary concepts and ideas that one acquires in the physical world, many concepts have to be fundamentally altered. Let us, from this standpoint, consider one of the most enigmatic concepts that we are faced with from the impressions of the physical world, that 
of death. In the physical world, a person always sees death from one side, from the side whereby he sees human life developing to the point where a person dies, that is, where the physical body initially falls away from the higher members of human nature and then decomposes within the physical world. One can truly say that what the person sees concerning death from the perspective of the physical world means that he is viewing it from the one side. Viewing it from the other side means seeing it in an opposite light, seeing it completely differently. When we enter through birth into physical life, our experience is such that we have not yet fully attained the high point of physical consciousness. You know that we do not remember the first years of our life with our ordinary physical consciousness. No one can, with his ordinary physical consciousness, remember his birth. At any rate, there is no one who will maintain that he can remember with his ordinary consciousness how he was born. We may say that it is a matter of physical consciousness that the moment of a person's birth must be forgotten. It is forgotten just as the first years of life are also forgotten. When in our physical life between birth and death we look back at our life, we remember back to a certain point. Then our memory breaks off. The point where it breaks off is not our physical birth, but includes a period subsequent to it. No one can know by experience that he was born. He can only conclude that he was. We conclude that we were born by and only by observing people being born after us. When scientists assert that they will only accept what they can see, none of them, if they were logically consistent, would be able to assert in accordance with this principle, that they had been born. For unless one is clairvoyant, it is impossible to perceive one's own birth. One can only infer it. Precisely the opposite happens with regard to death. The moment of the death that the person has previously undergone stands before the eyes of his soul, as the most vivid and most light-filled impression throughout the time between death and a new birth. But do not think that this is a painful impression. You would then be imagining that the dead person looks back upon what you see of death in the physical world, the decline and dissolution. Rather, does he see death from the other side? He sees in death something that one must call the most beautiful of experiences even in the spiritual world. For in what man is normally able to experience in the spiritual world, there is nothing more beautiful than the sight of death. To behold this victory of the spirit over matter, this radiating of the spiritual light of the soul from the dim darkness of the material world, is the greatest, most significant thing that can be perceived on the other side of the life through which man passes between death and a new birth. When a person lays aside the etheric body between death and a new birth and has gradually, fully re-established his consciousness, which occurs not very long after death, the situation is such that he no longer has the same relationship to himself that he has here in the physical world. When someone is asleep here in the physical world, he is unaware of himself, And when he awakes, he becomes aware that he has a self, an ego, or I, capital. In the spiritual world after death, it is somewhat different, since his self-consciousness is at a higher stage. It is not quite like that. I shall speak shortly about how it is. But there is essentially something like a reflective awareness of the ego, the self, Just as one needs to engage in self-reflection in the morning when one awakes, so is this also the case in the spiritual world. But this self-contemplation is a matter of looking back to the moment of death. It is always as if, in order to perceive our ego between death and a new birth, we were to say to ourselves, You have really died, therefore you are I, capital. You are an ego. This is the most significant point. One looks back at the victory of the spirit over the body, 
One looks back at the moment of death, which is the most beautiful experience that one can have in the spiritual world. And in this looking back, one becomes aware of one's self in the spiritual world. This is always not exactly like an awakening. This would be a one-sided way of interpreting it. But it is a case of becoming self-aware through looking back at one's death. It is therefore so important that a person has the possibility of really looking back at the moment of death with the full consciousness that emerges after death so that he does not in any way merely dream what he beholds then but can fully understand what he perceives. This is enormously important. We can there, moreover prepare ourselves for this already during life by trying to practice self-knowledge. It is a fundamental task of spiritual science to give people the self-knowledge that they need. For spiritual science is essentially a means of leading a person into his wider self, that self through which one belongs fundamentally to the whole world. I said that consciousness after death is somewhat different from here in the physical world. If I were to give you a pictorial impression of the nature of consciousness after death, I would do so in the following way. There's a picture. Here we have an eye, E-Y-E, and here an object. How do we become aware that there is an object outside us? By the impression that the object makes upon our eye. The object makes an impression on our eye and we come to know something about it. The object is out in the world. It makes an impression on our senses and we take the mental picture that we are able to form of the object into ourselves, into our soul. The object is outside us. The idea that we then form is given to us by it. In the spiritual world, it is different. Because I cannot draw it differently, I should like to draw what I always refer to as an I, E, Y, E, of the soul in the form of an I, although it is not strictly correct. This I of the soul, which a person has after death, is not so constituted that he, for instance, sees an angel or another human soul, which is also in the spiritual world, in the way that he sees a flower in the physical world. Rather does this I of the soul have the characteristic and We shall not at first think in terms of seeing a human soul, but rather a being of the higher hierarchies. That when an angel or archangel is present, the eye is not conscious of seeing an angel outside itself, but is instead aware of being seen by an angelic being. It is the exact opposite of the physical world. We live into the spiritual world in such a way that with respect to the beings of the higher hierarchies, we become aware that we are known by them, that they think us. We feel ourselves embedded in them. We feel ourselves comprehended by the angels, archangels, and spirits of personality, just as the realms of minerals, plants, and animals feel themselves comprehended by us. Only with respect to human souls is it the case that we can both be seen by them so that we have the feeling that they see us and we also have the feeling that our perception enters into them. It is a seeing that both we and other human souls undertake. With respect to all other beings of the higher hierarchies we have the feeling that we are perceived, thought, and visualized by them. And in that we are perceived, thought, and visualized by them, we are in the spiritual world. Suppose, therefore, that we are dwelling as a soul in the spiritual world, just as we abide in the physical world. We will constantly have the feeling of relating to the beings of the higher hierarchies, just as here in the physical world we have the feeling of entering into connection with the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms. The only difference is that we need constantly to be aware that we have a self. Then we look back to our death and say to ourselves, This is who you are. This awareness is ongoing. It is a constant component of our consciousness. What I am saying today represents an addition 
to various descriptions that you can derive from my cycles and books. What is expressed more inwardly here is described more from an external viewpoint in, for example, my book titled Theosophy. But only by perceiving something of this nature in more of a soul sense does one enter rightly into the experiences that one must have with respect to these matters and to the spiritual world as a whole. It is therefore self-knowledge that leads us forward, that makes us strong for the life between death and a new birth. This was brought home to me recently in a particularly vivid way when I had the task of speaking on several occasions at the cremations of friends of our movement. I always felt the necessity of saying something intimately connected with the character, with the self, of the one who had gone through the portal of death. Whence came this inspiration or intuition to convey to those who had died something connected with their being? It derived from the life of those individuals after their death. Anything that strengthens the forces of their self-knowledge is helpful to them. By speaking immediately after their death, when their consciousness has not yet awakened, of those qualities that they feel within themselves, it was possible, as it were, to liberate something of the strength that they need in order gradually to be able to develop the capacity to look back at the moment of death, when their whole being, in the way that it has developed between birth and death, appears in a concentrated form. One therefore helps the deceased person if one enables some aspect of what they remember of the qualities and experiences that belong to them to flow to them directly after their death. In this way one strengthens the power of self-knowledge. And if one is able clairvoyantly to enter into the soul of such a dead person, one feels in one's soul the urge, especially at this time, to hear something about the way he was, about things that he experienced, or about his main attributes. As you may understand, just as here on earth the life of one person is not like that of another, but the lives of all people differ one from another, so it is with those who have passed through the gate of death. No one's soul life is like another between death and a new birth. It could be said that every soul life that one can observe is a new revelation, and one can only emphasize certain particular qualities. I should like, both today and the day after tomorrow in Cologne, to speak about such things. I shall now speak of one specific example. Some time ago in Dornach we witnessed the departure from the physical plane of a member who had reached a fairly advanced age a member whose life had been spent in diligent, thoughtful work, but who in her last years had for some time been closely aligned with our spiritual scientific view of the world and had impressed it deeply into her heart, into her own soul. So one can say that this person had arrived at the point where in the latter part of her physical existence she was, as regards her feelings and sensibilities, completely at one with our world conception. Now, as you know, when a person goes through the portal of death, he first lays aside his physical body, continues for a while to bear his etheric body, and then lays this aside as well. Then comes a time when the person must first gradually acquire the consciousness that will be his between death and a new birth. As we know, he then experiences a full review of his life as a great life's tableau. At this time the powerful impulses residing within his soul emerge all of a sudden, so that much that is of significance in this respect may appear quite differently than during his life. While he is alive, a person is to a large extent bound by the limits that his physical body places upon him. Immediately after death one overcomes the heaviness, burdensome nature and solidity of the physical body, which weaken the clarity of many soul impulses. If the soul has during life strongly absorbed the impulses of spiritual science, if it has embraced these impulses with its innermost feelings, it can also unfold these impressions after death in a quite different way, since it has the availability of the supple, flexible, etheric body that is no longer constrained by the physical body.
One could especially see this in that individual of whom I have just spoken, who shortly after her death, after I had managed to enter fully into her soul, poured forth from her soul what had lived within her by way of spiritual scientific impulses. She would not, of course, have expressed herself in such words during physical life, but because the etheric body was still there, she was able to clothe it in physical words. What she had taken into herself through spiritual science became the expression of her soul, while she still retained her supple etheric body. And the necessity then arose that a few days later at the cremation of the person concerned, I had to speak these very words that had sounded forth from her being, which therefore belonged not to me, but to her. Quote, In world expanses I will to bear my feeling heart, that warm it may become, in the fire of the working of holy forces. In world thoughts I will to weave my own thinking, that clear it may become in the light of the eternal life in becoming. In soul foundations I will to immerse the sense of what has been, that strong it may become for true aims of human working. In God's peace I so aspire, midst life's struggles and concerns, myself for the higher self preparing. Striving for peace in joyous work, sensing world being in my own being, I would fulfill man's highest duty. May I live expectantly in the light of destiny's star that grants me the place in the realm of spirit. Close quote. In these words, which express a soul's feelings after death, there resides what this soul has become through spiritual science. Then came the time which everyone has to pass through more or less after death, a time that cannot really be called a time of sleep. For when one has laid aside the etheric body, one is indeed immediately fully within the spiritual world, but one is blinded by its rich abundance. One cannot take it all in. One first has to adapt the forces that one has brought with one to the spiritual world and thereby attune oneself to it. One sees too much after death. There is indeed consciousness, and it must first be adjusted to the level of the forces that one has acquired. One then begins to be able to orient oneself and really live in the spiritual world. It is not actually quite correct to say that one awakes to consciousness after a certain time. One should say that one has too much consciousness, and would need to tone it down to the level where it becomes bearable. This is then the moment of awakening. The soul of whom I have just been speaking therefore entered into this state, when the etheric body has been laid aside, of not being able to bear the spiritual light. But it had a great deal of strength. You can see this from the words that I have read. And this strength had gradually been wholly permeated by the influence that spiritual science is able to bring to bear upon a person's feeling and willing. Some time after death it therefore happened that this being, this soul, arrived at a state of consciousness which it could bear. One could, of course, say much about the time that then begins for a soul if one were to describe everything that such a soul experiences. Only parts of this can be described, and in that we stand within our movement, the most significant thing to be observed in souls is what connects them to our movement. One can learn from what connects human souls in general after death with the whole world, but one can best observe the life of the soul after death through souls that are as closely affiliated to one as this soul of whom I am now speaking. And so it happened that it could first be observed that this soul came to a self-orienting consciousness by participating in our meetings, by actually taking part in our meetings. This involvement fully manifested itself at this year's Easter festival in Dornach, where the attempt was made to explain to our dear friends in Dornach something of the profound meaning of Easter. This soul was present. It took part just as she had formerly participated with an inner warmth 
just as many who still inhabit their physical body have the need to add something to what they have heard. It wanted to say something, and the remarkable thing is that it formulated in words, because through this it had the possibility of understanding their meaning, how it was now living, and especially with regard to what it had experienced at this Easter lecture. And what then came was something like an addition to the verses communicated shortly after her death. These additional words, which now emerged from her consciousness, are as follows. Quote, to human souls I would direct spirit feeling that wills to awaken the word of Easter in the heart. With human spirits I would think warmth of soul that powerfully they can feel the risen one. Close quote. One can see that this soul wants to work further with those with whom it was connected in our spiritual scientific movement. It wants to dedicate itself to them so that the message of Easter awakens in their hearts as the Easter lecture had sought to achieve, so that they may develop a right feeling for what in spiritual science we call the Risen One. But something that came to expression in the following three lines was of particular significance. This was especially beautiful and deeply moving. I had in those Easter lectures and in many other lectures that I gave at that time made a repeated effort to do what I have already done, namely to draw attention to the significance that spiritual science has not only for this present earthly life, but for the whole world. Someone who passes through the gate of death can have a direct experience of this and have an understanding of what is happening within spiritual science. I therefore advise so many people whose loved ones have passed through the portal of death to read or speak to them about spiritual scientific teachings. For what has been formulated in spiritual scientific words has significance not only for souls living in the physical body, but is deeply meaningful for souls that are disembodied. It comes to them as a spiritual breath of life, as a spiritual water of life. Or to put it another way, they perceive light emanating from us who are down below. For us, this light is, one might say, symbolic, for we hear words and receive them as thoughts into our soul, but the dead really see it as a spiritual light. Now, it is highly significant that this soul, who has often heard such things, wanted formally to say, I have understood this. It is really so. For its words in this connection were, quote, Earth flame of spirit knowledge brightly irradiates death's dark appearance. Close quote. It is a reality for the soul. It wishes to say, What you speak in those nether regions shines upward like a flame. And it expressed this by saying, Earth flame. It brightly irradiates death's dark appearance. Why does it speak of death's dark appearance? If you think about it, you will understand. It said this because it has often heard us referring to the world as Maya. On the earth it lives in the senses world of appearances. Now it is also in a world of appearances through which it must for the first time perceive real being. Quote, earth flame of spirit knowledge brightly irradiates death's dark appearance. Close quote. Steiner again. And then something that strengthens the soul. Quote, the self becomes world eye and ear. Close quote. World ear is what is meant. It means that the whole self now becomes like a mighty sense organ. It becomes an organ of perception for the whole world. There is a beauty in the way in which the dead person shows how she is aware that what spiritual science says is true. For this soul it is characteristic that immediately after death it wants to express itself and say, Yes, I have reached the point where that which I have learned on earth is presented to me as true. These words had a certain importance for me because they came from the spiritual world, from that soul of whom I have been speaking a few weeks after another deeply satisfying event had occurred. Friends of our movement lost a fairly young son in the present war 
who had voluntarily enlisted. The young man fell in battle. He had begun to show an interest in spiritual science shortly before his death. He was only seventeen or eighteen. He had died after falling in battle. After some time it could be seen that the soul of this young man, and it is often the case that souls who have crossed the threshold of death in battle come fairly quickly to consciousness, approached his parents, really came close to them. And it was possible to hear him say to them, I should like you to understand that it is becoming clear to me that what I have been hearing in your house about spiritual science, about spiritual light and spiritual beings, is true, and that what I have been hearing is helping me. I mention this not because there is anything special about this, but because it shows the nature of the connection between earthly life and spiritual life. There is also something else remarkable that I want to mention in this connection. After a lecture that I gave in one of our branches, I went to the parents in question and told them this. I had at the time written down the words that had come through, and also informed them of the night when it had occurred that the young man approached his parents and had addressed their souls in the manner described. The father then said, quote, This is quite extraordinary. I very seldom have dreams, but that same night I dreamt of my boy. I dreamt that he appeared to me, and that he wanted to say something to me, but I had not understood it. Close quote. People outside our spiritual movement today will find it strange if such things are related to them, and so it is best to keep them as far as possible to ourselves. But it is, nonetheless, important that we explore these things more fully, for our knowledge is formed out of these individual building stones of experiences from the spiritual world. And we will only be able to arrive at a clear picture if we do not merely confine ourselves to listening to beautiful theories about the spiritual world, but if we are able to make spiritual science so vitally alive within our souls that we are able to bear it when the spiritual world is spoken of in the way that reasonable people speak of what they experience in the world of the senses. Spiritual science will only become alive within us in the right way, and it should indeed become fully alive within us, if we derive life from it and not merely knowledge or a teaching. This will enable it to bridge for us the gulf that through materialism, which in the absence of spiritual science will inevitably spread ever more widely, exists between the physical sense perceptible world through which we pass between birth and death and the spiritual world in which we live between death and a new birth so that we gradually learn to become citizens also of the spiritual world. It is this that matters, that we learn to feel that a person who has passed through the gate of death has merely taken on a different form of life, and for our feeling may be regarded after death as someone who, through the events of life, has had to emigrate to a distant country, where we shall be able to follow him at some later date. So, all that we have to bear is a time of separation. But this must be livingly felt and experienced through spiritual science. If you do but form a picture formed of various specific facts, you will see that even for someone who cannot perceive the spiritual world, these facts harmonize and are in accord with one another, that the belief that one has before perceiving the spiritual world is no blind belief, no belief in authority, but a belief carried by a feeling that is deeper than critical knowledge, by the human soul's innate feeling for truth. We are living at a time when the outer destiny-laden events indicate that we need to enter more deeply into human life. It would be much better if instead of discussing who is to blame for this war and who is doing this or that, people would consider the events of the war as an awakening call to gain a deeper understanding of human souls than the overwhelming majority of people have achieved so far. Among the most important things that I have said is that I have indicated that we must learn through spiritual science to transform, to review our conceptions and ideas. Among these conceptions, we can now, and this will be added today to our considerations of this highly important subject of death, 
include that of the war. One would be right, also from a spiritual scientific point of view, to regard the war as an illness of evolution. It is certainly an illness, but you should bear in mind that you do not do justice to an illness if you judge it for what it is. What manifests itself through an illness is also largely what preceded the illness in the human body, the lack of order, the disharmony. Then comes the illness, which often arises in order to counteract what was disorderly in the body. Even when someone has an illness before death, this is so. He is carrying certain disharmonies which make it impossible for him to enter directly into the spiritual world. The spiritual world would perhaps be imperceptible to him for too long or there would be other hindrances because there are disharmonies within him that cannot be brought into the spiritual world. This is why an illness may befall someone before death. This makes his soul sufficiently free from disharmony that he can enter the spiritual world. If it is an illness that leads to recovery, the reason for this illness is that what preceded it, what was determined by the karma of former lives, perhaps by thousands of years, may be balanced out. It is, for example, not a good thing to say that if a child has measles, it should not have had this illness. One cannot know what might have happened to the child if it had not had the measles to deal with. For what was living deeply within the child came out through the illness and found its balance. So it is also good to observe the war and to see what is wrong, not so much in what now has to be undergone in blood and iron, but also to contemplate what has taken place within cultural streams over long, long periods of time. People must learn to look more deeply into these connections. After this war, a time will come when people will begin to reflect about it. They will then come to realize how many empty words have been spoken in the course of assigning blame to one party or another. And even if it is fairly long after the war, something will surely emerge, and people will speak quite differently than they do now. There will be people who will say, if history continues to be studied as it has been studied hitherto, One will find this or that in this or that act of diplomacy. These things are recorded in one place or another. But if one proceeds in the way that history has hitherto dealt with everything and seeks objectively to judge everything, as one says, one will never discover why this war arose. One will then become aware that it is necessary to look beyond the outward causes to the deeper reasons that spiritual science will have to explain. Unfortunately, it is only possible today to give some hints about these things. One will find that in many places, at the time of the outbreak of the war, some event happened where consciousness did not play a significant part, but something unconscious took place beneath the threshold of outer events, so that those things which the historian is accustomed to look upon as factors pertinent to discovering the causes of the events are not of any relevance. One will learn from this example that history in its customary form does not tell us anything at all. It will be an awakening call to look for deeper reasons. Just as in virtually each one of the lectures that I have given recently, I had to direct a kind of awakening call to our souls by way of a conclusion, I should like to do so again today. One has to bear a certain responsibility simply through having developed some relationship to spiritual science. The spiritual scientific conception of the world must at least enable one to become capable of thinking that those superficial judgments, which because of the hold that materialism has over the world, are everywhere favored, should not be the judgments that we make as advocates of spiritual science. What is taking place today is a superficial hatred from nation to nation. I have spoken much about this in our branch lectures. It does not need to fill us in the same way, but we should also not become unfair, and we can learn from the old theosophical society how to become really unfair. What they impressed upon their members with respect to religions was that all religions are the same. 
This is more or less the equivalent of telling people that there are some condiments or food supplements on the table. Pepper, salt, sugar, paprika, they are all the food supplements of some kind. One should not give preference to one over another. Thus, if I have a cup of coffee and add pepper to it, that's all one and the same. The same logic applies when one says that the same kernel of truth underlies all religions. This logic does, to be sure, save one the trouble of studying the great wonderful evolution of the world in all its details. For one arrives at the proposition that one kernel of truth is at the foundation of everything. But with respect to this, we have long freed ourselves from the most superficial judgments. Thus the wish to enter with loving understanding into the distinctive quality of every nationality, which we rightly acknowledge, should not prevent us from seeing where our hearts need to stand when guided by our understanding. It will not be possible for all our friends to agree in this respect. This, however, is not the point. What matters is that our souls endeavor to detach themselves from the standpoint of the outer world and enter into the distinctive qualities of the various folk souls. We shall then see that those who identify themselves with our spiritual scientific world conception have in many respects a certain responsibility, the responsibility toward a thoroughness and a deeper insight into actualities that spiritual science makes possible. One then sometimes makes some painful discoveries. One learns that the great awakening call that confronts us through the fateful events that surround us does not make all souls feel obliged to enter with their hearts more deeply and more thoroughly into what is going on in the form of the superficial judgments of materialism, which we wish to overcome. In this respect, one would wish and yearn for souls who are within our movement to form a host of people who adopt a certain thoroughness also with respect to the questions that stir us deeply today. And thoroughness is necessary today in so many ways. One has no idea of all that is possible in our time. I could say a great deal about things that can deeply stir the heart of anyone who really follows with human love what is going on in our time. Much in the way of thoughts and views is being disseminated, sometimes with the best of intentions, out of an unhealthy world conception ensnared by Araman. But especially with regard to the flood of literature about the war, we must in many ways deepen our thoughts about the tasks of cultural development. Such an attempt is now being made in our lectures by indicating the real position of the various peoples, for it is in many respects a matter of defending thoroughness against superficiality. It has, for example, in recent weeks been possible to experience something very remarkable. For understandable reasons, I would not want to give the title of a book that appeared outside Germany, although in the German language, which it is maintained was written by a German. I should expressly like to emphasize that one can bring oneself to understand any possible viewpoint. One can, perhaps, understand the most anti-German viewpoint when it is presented by someone or other. One will try to understand it. One does not need to share it, but one can perhaps understand it. But this book to which I am referring has features which have nothing to do with the fact that it adopts a thoroughly anti-German standpoint, pouring venom in every line upon Germany and the German nature. One could even understand the fact that it is poisonously written. But nevertheless, no one should come and say that if a German speaks in this way about the book, we can understand this to mean that he is saying something disparaging about Germany and its culture. However, there is something else that really matters here. The book is written in such a way that anyone who has a little feeling for inner objectivity and inner thoroughness, and who has had some education, must find that it is the most dreadful imitation of the worst kind of trash. Quite irrespective of the viewpoint that it expresses, it is in a literary sense so abysmal that if anyone finds something worth having in the book, this shows that he is taking what is from a literary point of view mere trash 
a book that has been cobbled together and written out of sheer, utterly overt ignorance, as something that should be taken seriously. Thus it is not a question of the author's standpoint. It is that one sees from the manner in which it is written, such as no one who has learned to think, even in a formal sense, would write, that one is dealing here with a book of very limited value. Nevertheless, I have had to hear judgments that this book, whose title I shall not give for particular reasons, is taken seriously. When such things occur, it is up to us not to shrink back, but to form a judgment on the basis of a certain comprehensiveness. Even if someone may perhaps agree with certain sentences expressed in this book, he still does not need to take the book seriously, for the very reason that it is a dreadful, shoddy piece of work, and one does not take such a shoddy piece of work seriously. Because one would not wish that something that is itself true should be expressed in such a dreadful manner, with the worst possible feeling, and in an uncultured way. I wanted to characterize such an example purely for the reason that I wanted to draw attention to the fact that many things are involved when the spiritual scientist tries to form a judgment about the world. If it were really possible to consider a book to be good, even if it is stylistically a disaster, this would be a sign that one has not made spiritual, scientific feeling sufficiently alive in one's heart, in one's soul. It is certainly not for any reason other than to draw attention to the way in which spiritual science must livingly penetrate our feeling and thinking to the most radical degree that such specific examples are cited in this realm. And it is indeed necessary that such specific impulses are sought within our souls. I must admit that the dreadful rejoicing that has hitherto brought people a particular sense of satisfaction when journeying through Germany is not now in evidence, even after great victories. One has observed something of the way that in every soul there has at the same time been pain and grief concerning the immense losses. I believe that it is so. The vain rejoicing at victory is not the only sound to ring forth. For these fateful, destiny-laden days that we are now experiencing demand not only immense sacrifices, but they open up an enormous number of wounds, also spiritual wounds, if one considers the behavior of many people. It is therefore necessary that we, now and again, recall, especially when we are considering important elements from the realm of spiritual science, what responsibility has been placed upon our souls and how we must be longing for times when the influences of the young, unspent etheric bodies and those of the souls who are still on earth in the bodies of human beings and are able to send up their feelings and soul capacities can indeed meet one another. A time will come after this war when the unspent etheric bodies of those who have passed through the portal of death and have developed forces from the sacrifices that they have made and who are now able to send them down for the spiritualization of mankind will exert their influence. But down below there must be souls who are able to receive this, souls who will look up in living faith to what has ascended into the spiritual world from those who have passed prematurely through death in order to radiate down to the earth forces for the spiritualization of mankind. In order that what I have been saying at the conclusion of this lecture may come clearly before our minds, I should like again to speak these words, quote, From the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit, if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. <laughs>